Well, anyway, let's move on to another topic. Yep. Um, now, high dynamic range. It's, yes. a, it's pretty much what I'm going to be covering specifically at NAB. And mm. I, actually, what I want to do at NAB is actually try and demystify it and open it up to um, accessibility to high dynamic range. So I study high dynamic range quite a lot. It's actually not that hard to do. You do not need to be studying it as hard as you want. You just need to be told, like, pretty much... Most of the editing systems and resolves and the color grading mm -hmm. systems can do it now. It's basically like a, a different matrix or a different mode that you put the system in. And then you need a new high dynamic range monitor to, to grade against. Mm -hmm. And then you can pretty much, you know, because the, the PQ, the ST2084 um, curve or the EOTF or the replacement for gamma has been decided pretty much. There's also hybrid blog gamma and all, all these other typical little um, questions. But everyone seems to be leaning towards the 2084 sort of path. Um, and so all those standards and understandings are in position now, right? So it's not hard to go out there, buy a good monitor, upgrade your system and start, you know, getting some raw content and making a high dynamic range result. Mm -hmm. Now, the big, um, big question marks in the world is all the distribution sides, the, the 2094 developments and the SD standards, etc., uh, where they're doing a lot of the development on how we distribute um, standard def and high def all together and make the whole world sing as a big, nice big song. And how does right. this all get yeah. punched through? Yeah. That's right. But the real question is here is um, how is high dynamic range going to change the canvas or change the way we um, make the content? Like there's a learning curve involved. Uh, how long before we see it grow out of the um, when 3D came in and you had those things that came out and poked you in the eye, sort of silly things because it was 3D. And, it was and then it evolved into the right spot. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, how far down that track do you think we are? And where do you see high dynamic range mainly getting its traction and really pushing the envelope of the, the, the media that we watch and use, use today? Yeah, so, so I'm not going to be your, your super expert voice on this. Okay. Uh, I will be um, a very sort of broad, I think a broad swath at it, and then I'll let you talk to other voices that do yeah. this all day long. That's right. It's an area of interest to me, but it is not um, what I would say is, is the most interest to me. It's, a, it's an evolution on making a better picture. That's true. Which I think is a, a Common sense. great aspiration, and, and, but, but I don't consider it actually particularly futuristic. It's, it's an obviousness of where things will go. Yeah. Um, I like it because there's futuristic and there's futuristic in terms of it's going to affect us within the next two years. Sure. And, yeah. and the high dynamic range is in that, that, that area. And I like, I like to focus on things which are going to affect the viewers yeah. in the next six months to a year's time. Yeah. With I, mean, I always think about you know, referring, and I do this a lot, I refer to the successes of the past as to right. where to look for the future. So if you look at the evolution of film stocks, the goal of film stocks was to increase the dynamic range right. constantly, yeah. right? And you could see that evolution if you track a new film historian, you could see, you know, well, we moved to black and white and we moved to color and then we moved to better color and better color and lower grain and higher range of capabilities and film still produces an amazing range. Now digital has over the last, you know, relatively near term, let's talk the last 10 years, started to approach what film can do and then in some cases can exceed it. Right. And then the distribution mechanisms um, and the display mechanisms are starting to, to play their role. So in the, in the Barco world, which I can refer to very specifically because I know something about this, um, they are delivering on their new laser projector, a flagship laser projector, a special high contrast version. That's right. Very which interesting. Is, doubles the, the contrast. Right. You lose a, a certain degree of light, 30 so percent of the light. Right. So you give up something to get something. But because these machines and, and laser projectors are so insanely efficient, That's right. um, you're not really giving up anything. You can still light up a huge screen um, with one of these laser projectors right. and get that deep, deep, deep black and find the top end whites in a way that um, can go to scale. And, is, and you're literally, it's the same projector, so it's just better science, right? right. It doesn't have to cost millions of dollars in the deployment. It's the same projector that all these big exhibitors are putting in, and they're having the ability now to make a choice to play it at maximum light level or maximum um, deep black level. Now, what's interesting is what do customers really care about? Now, mm -hmm. scientists and technicians and people in the, in the craft of it will tell you that the deepest blacks are the most amazing thing and for all of us that have the golden eyes that live in the cinemas all day long and do all this stuff we love that experience yes but i'm willing to sort of bet that if you put regular audience in and just show them a massively brighter picture 
that just fills their field of view in a wonderful way versus something that has really deep blacks, they would likely say brighter is, is the more sort of overt way to do this. So it's interesting because you have to train your audience to understand the nuances, That's right? right? Yeah. There's an overt way is like brightness, brightness, brightness. That's right. There's a more nuanced way is brightness plus better blacks. That's right. Better awareness that the screen can kind of like go away a little bit in a super dark room. Um, so that's kind of my sort of angle on it. I don't have a deep technology no, angle on it. I just I'm, think I'm, it's I think it's a great evolution, and we continue to drive on it. And I think you're going to see a lot of stuff at NAB, both for cinema and of course for home panels for for you know CNC. Right, yeah. Yes, is all the home panels. Are we covering a lot of it in terms of? It, it's changing very fast, and to to, to a degree, because I, I studied this. Um, we're sort of rushing down the road before we actually know where it's going. Which is fine, which is what we tend to do anyway. That's right. All of our <laughs> um, and that's why it's a little bit exciting because uh, it's like you're looking behind the curtain and looking over the over the green over, over the green hill to see what's on the other side. And so it's, it's yeah. driving to us technologists. And, and that's futurists. that's what I do every day. I mean, yeah. I'm just exploring all kinds of things. That's why you know my world of VR, my world of escape is just constantly exploring the boundaries. What I, what I would say the boundaries of sanity. Yes. I like to be on the other side of sanity when it comes to what is possible uh, because it takes people that are a little crazy to then become what is possible. If you're, if you're on the side of that's not really achievable yet, then you don't actually achieve anything. You have to sort of work on the side of this is not perfected by any means, this is a process that we're going to go through to make things better. And sometimes we're wrong, sometimes we miss it. Or sometimes it takes many turns of the cycle to get it right, which is I think what VR is going through, what HDR is going through, and what we're going through with immersive cinema with Barco Escape. Okay, so let's finish up, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to say to you, open the floor and say, okay, what's making you excited in the futuristic aspect of digital medium and storytelling this year sure. at NAB? Okay, so what gets me excited is that we are building better technology tools and better ways to view our entertainment experiences and better ways to interact with our entertainment experiences than we've ever had the ability to do in the past. And we're able to take it to mass scale because of digital computer-based, silicon-based technology. Um, we have extraordinarily better tool sets mm -hmm. and better technology than we had even a quarter of a generation ago, even just five, 10 years ago. That's right. Um, and now the question is, what are we going to do with it? How do we use it? And what we're starting to see, and what I sort of have made now my career yeah, about, right. yeah, okay. is here's all this wonderful technology. How do we put it into practice? How do we find the right craftsmen at the right time that are going to actually hit these things out of the park, that are going to make something that's so compelling in a way that's so new that this is now becoming the new way to enjoy our entertainment, mm. to relax and, and interact and do things. So I see that on the VR front, yep. uh, in our world at Fox, we're really leading the charge. I see that on the cinema front, with Barco Escape, yep. leading the charge. It's fun to be leading the charge. And when you lead the charge, you don't really quite know where right. you're going. But you don't gets, know what's around the next right, corner. But it gets you up in the morning. But it does get me up in the morning. <laughs> put a smile on my face. And exactly I right. often say what I do every single day is that's way right. better than a real job. And, and I have, and it's a very, see, the thing that sort of occurred to me while you're having this discussion is that uh, we always talk about the, how technology is evolving faster and faster. It's ex exponential. And to a degree, I, when you're talking about this, I say, well, your job's getting harder and harder mm. because every year that goes by, you get a lot more potential technologies, potential capabilities to have to yeah. put in to deal with it and figure out how you're going to turn that into a medium or, or, or something that's going to you know, affect the industry in, in a positive way. And I think there are some people, and I, and I work a lot with them, that have the personality that those aren't limitations, those are opportunities. No, absolutely. That, that the more things that can hit Changes. you, the more you can absorb, and you have to be a little bit like a dragonfly. You, you, you can't get caught into your own web Right? You have to just know that there are many webs out there that, that, that you can experiment. So maybe spiders, oh, I'm totally with you. spiders are a better reference to Dragonfly. That's right. But the more the tool sets allow us to look at new ways to approach things, as you saw today when you went to the theater. It's like a year ago, I didn't have that approach. No. I didn't have people, I was like the only one that was saying, you know, we can try these. And now you have a set of craftsmen that are actually 
finding new approaches and better approaches than I would have ever thought of on my own. I just feel like I'm the one that, that has to light the match and, and I don't mind being that guy. So it's, you know, when you're the one lighting the match in the dark cave, you're holding it up and you're looking around and it's all dark, but That's you're right. just trying to guide the, guide and, the light. And based on, so one of the things that, uh, I want to turn this to, into a message that I want to put out there, okay. right? The things you were saying, I agree with completely. And one of the things that's frustrated me in recent years, especially in Australia, is that what I call the good enough syndrome, mm. right? Um, because the the price pressures, etc. Sure. There's the reality of that's of exactly this, right. right? Yeah. And one of the things that um, has paid the price because of this trend mm -hmm. is in Australia. Australia used to be because I'm from Australia. It's where I hang, where I live, yeah, etc. Yeah, we can tell by your accent. Australia used to be very forward, forward thinking, like Flame and some amazing early technologies sure. in post-production came from Australia. Yeah. And they usually were born in Australia yeah, yeah. and used to come to Curated America out there and, and yeah. come to America where they blossomed. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Australia now, it's, it's very the good enough syndrome and it really disappoints me because when I was in post very young, when I, I was in post when I was very young and we were doing uncompressed high, high, dynamic, high def content, so we had the first um, uh, DS in the southern hemisphere, mm. we were beta testers for it, we were, leading, you know, we were doing really well at that stage right. and um, we were, we were do, playing on the edge like you, we were looking at the new technologies, figuring out how we could make them and, and you know, networking our facility, the first in Australia and all that sort of stuff. Sure, sure. But that's sort of died off in Australia now because mm. everyone's doing sure. what they can do, you know, the, well, I hope the good it comes enough back. That's it. And I've been, encouraging, point. I've been encouraging that. I've been putting some demonstrations together in Australia to say, look, there's all this new stuff going. If you're not, I know the good enough syndrome's there, but you need to look forward because I, I say to them is that there's a lot of new stuff coming around yeah. and you're going to have to create this stuff. Yeah. And when the when your producer or, or comes to you and says, okay, we're doing this thing in high dynamic range, I don't want your eyes to glaze over and I have no idea what to no, do. Yeah, I, I have some expectations of what that means. That's exactly right. I've actually learned a little bit about it. That's right. I, yeah, sure. And I've been encouraging the community to, okay, you it's need important. to at least get a base understanding. Well, that's what Silicon Valley has done so well, right? That's is, right. Is they're not afraid to keep pushing it, but they do have economic success exactly of right. the risk reward. Um, to, to back themselves up uh, and, and you know many areas around the world that are technology hubs um, have seen massive rewards of taking those risks right. so when you understand that and you understand that you will fail more than you will succeed when you take these kind of risks yes. but when you do succeed you can succeed so massively that they can cover up and 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 more than make up for all of the success yeah, all, the, all the risks that you've had to but, take. But, but as we said before like um these new mediums are a learning process. You don't learn unless you fail. Right, exactly. Right, and so you have to take it on board. Failure that... is part of the understanding exactly of, right. of going new. There's, there's two things, there's, there's that, and then there's also a, a very uh, credible theory which I adhere to, that um, perfection is the enemy of progress. So when you're constantly like trying to get something in your mind that's perfect, or doesn't have any flaws at all, it's hard to make progress at the pace that we need to make today to, to get to an audience mm -hmm. acceptance. So if you look at the evolution of just our personal computing environments, in the early days, so what imagine saying? if someone was waiting till it was all right to then release these things into that's the right. market, right? Yeah, so that's very much the, that's very much the, the Silicon Valley sort of aspect. Like what you, what I'm, I like to turn the, the, what you said around and say what you're trying, saying here is that we. Do, it's not so important to be perfect, to, to be perfection, it's more important to evolve. Right. Exactly right. Um, anyway, we'll leave it at that. That's a good way to end. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, A nice, Ted. good conversation. And My uh, pleasure. Always good to see you, you uh, at, in, in uh, yeah, Las in, Vegas. In the world year. of Vegas, which we spent far that's too much time in. But yeah, that's really. right. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, that's James Garden with Ted Shulowitz, um the futuristic, futurist from Fox. From Transcentral Fox, yeah. And also um, the representative from Barco yeah. here at uh, Las Vegas. We're actually at CinemaCon, but next week we head straight into NAB. Bye for now from uh, CinemaCon 2016.